I'm Chef AJ, your host, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people, just like you, who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. And today's guest is no exception. If you're at all involved in the plant-based world, he is an icon. He's an icon in every world as far as I'm concerned. He is one of the kindest people you'll ever meet, and he is so knowledgeable about plant-based nutrition. And like a past guest last week, he is also an Olympian, so I'm hoping he'll talk about his experience at the Olympics. And he's also the co-founder of probably the best conference there is out there. We know there's no conferences right now in person, so they're going to do it virtually this year. And we're talking about the Plantrician Conference that he is a co-founder of, and we'll give you an, a link so that you can register. Please welcome Dr. Scott Stoll. Oh, Chef AJ, thank you so much. Thank you for the kind introduction and this amazing opportunity to have a conversation today. I always love our conversations and I love your smile. Oh my God, thank you. It's a lot of joy, so thank you. Oh my God, thank you. You are so kind. Do people tell you you look like Robbie Barbero? You guys look alike to me, like, <laughs> like you're his long lost dad. Yeah, we absolutely, they tell us that all the time. You know, Robbie has a dynamic smile. He's an amazing person. So it's an honor to be uh, associated with him. So yeah, thanks. Yeah. Well, I know you guys have lots of questions and people even sent them in. This happens anytime we have a medical doctor, but I want to start on a personal note. Cause like I said, I've only met four Olympians in my life and you were one of them. What, was that one of the greatest moments of your life? What is it like to go to the Olympics where your parents just insanely proud of you? Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was a, the fulfillment of a little boy's dream. You know, I grew up like so many people watching the summer and the winter Olympics and thinking, oh, wouldn't it be amazing to walk into the opening ceremony someday? And I would go outside at night and I would sprint up and down the road and pretend I was running in the Olympics. And in the wintertime, if I watched the bobsledding, I would actually go outside and pretend I was bobsledding in the Olympics. And so, you know, all these years passed and then to walk into the opening ceremonies in 1994 was just an amazing, surreal moment. And that kind of um, culmination of all those years of dreaming with that reality of being there in that space, um, you know, where the center point of the world is watching. It was, it was truly remarkable. I'm not even sure what bobsledding is. How many of you are, I like, what, what, how do you become a bobsledder? I mean, I'm in California, so we don't have it here. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. I. Uh, a lot of the bobsledders come out of track and football backgrounds. And so I ran track from second grade all the way up through college, played football through high school. And I always loved bobsledding. And I happened to be watching the 1992 Olympics with a friend of mine from my track team in my basement in Fort Collins, Colorado. And I simply said to my friend, Doug, I said, you know what, Doug, I have always loved bobsledding and I would love to try out for it. So my friend Doug is one of those great can-do people. So he picked up the phone and called the Olympic Training Center and said, hey, how do you try out for the bobsled team? And so they uh, invited us down to the Olympic Training Center. They do a six-item sprinting and jumping test every year. So I went down and I took the six-item test and I scored well enough that I was invited to the uh, push championships in 1992 where they fly in about 80 people from around the country that have scored well. And they have a little bobsled on rails uh, and with electronic timing eyes. So you have a competition during the course of the week pushing this bobsled for time and at the end of the week i had pushed fast enough that i made the team and i was given a helmet and shoes and sent off on the world cup circuit uh, to begin bobsledding and so you know they have a two-man bobsled and they have a four-man bobsled and so during the world cup circuit you would go between both but at the olympics i was on the four-man bobsled which consists of a driver in the front a uh, brakeman behind him, a brakeman on the back, and then I was pushing from the right side. And it's this coordinated effort of pushing the bobsled as fast as you can, because every hundredth of a second at the uh, top of the hill that you're behind, there's a 300 uh, hundredth of a second difference at the bottom. And oftentimes, you know, a medal is separated by hundredths of a second after four miles of racing. So those hundredths of a second make a difference. So you push this bobsled as fast as you can, and then you have to coordinate getting into this bobsled as the sled's going down the hill and not getting yourselves tangled up in the process. So you had a very important position on that bobsled. Everybody was important. And you really learn the importance of a team effort. You know, if one member of the team is out of sync or is not pushing as fast or missteps, the whole team loses. And so if you really see that important of that synchronicity of a team working together and knowing each other's movements. Do you have video footage of this? Is this something that you can watch regularly? 
I do have footage and I have uh, slides and pictures. You know, we didn't have digital cameras back then, so that's how long ago it was. But we do have some really fun footage and it's, it's great to pull that out. I pull it out and my children say, wow, dad, you were really big and strong back then. <laughs> I think that'd be so cool if you let other people see it because that, that would just be incredible, especially because even though it may have been a dream, you didn't really train for bobsledding your whole life. No, that's exactly right. You know, it was kind of a, a transfer of skills from track and field, um, you know, that speed, but I had to increase my weight and I had to increase my strength in order to make the, the bobsled team. And I really learned like the, the value of being truly uh, single focused and self-disciplined in order to get there. Wow. So was this before you went to medical school? This was before I went to medical school and one of the uh, unique positions, I, I started bobsledding and then I got accepted to medical school. And so I had to apply to my medical school for a deferment to continue bobsledding in order to make the Olympic team. And so I was very blessed that the University of Colorado gave me a deferment to push through the 1994 Olympics and then start medical school after the Olympics. Where were the 1994 Olympics held? They were in this beautiful little Norwegian town called Lillehammer. And uh, it was uh, a very unique place in the world. It was a tiny town with one street. So the entire world converged on Lillehammer, Norway for the opening ceremonies. It was, uh, and the Norwegian people were just amazing hosts. It was truly incredible. Did your family come? Yes, you know, I was so blessed that my parents came and I was actually dating my wife at the time. And so she traveled over with my parents uh, and my brother. And so, you know, we all have that shared experience. It's one of those, those um, unique uh, experiences in life that you can't put into words. You can come home and show pictures, but if you haven't been there, it's, you, you can't understand or have that same emotional uh, feel for that, that unique event. So yes, they were there, they cheered me on, they got to go to the closing ceremonies and uh, we have that you know, beautiful, unique time of, of sharing that experience together. That is so cool. Are you still in touch with your three teammates? Um, I keep in touch with them and I see them periodically uh, at bobsledding events. I still work um, every year as a team physician with the bobsled and uh, bobsled and skeleton team. and I cover races for them. So it's been a blessing that I get to take one of my children with me every year, stay at the Olympic Training Center. Sometimes we go to Europe and cover races and they've got they've had that unique opportunity to be a part of like an Olympic team uh, and a bobsled team and to stay in the Olympic Training Centers and uh, and live that life and uh, you know unfortunately i think after being there and watching me pull all of these people out of the sleds after they've crashed and seeing all the injuries my children have want no nothing to do with bobsledding because they've seen the dangerous part of it did you ever get injured bobsledding no thankfully not you know the crashes that we had were relatively minor other than a few ice burns i did not have any major injuries which i was really grateful for because you know the sleds go up to 90 miles an hour and uh, you pull up to five times the force of gravity in a, in a turn. And so when the sled flips over, it's not uncommon for people to um, you know, get concussions, uh, broken bones and suffer some pretty significant injuries. Yeah. Matt wants to know, do you train or work with any of the plant-based athletes? Um, I, currently, I don't necessarily uh, work with them, but I have in the past. Um, I don't train, my, I train right now with my boys. So they are plant-based athletes. We do a lot of exercise and lifting together, but um, not currently. Uh, I have coached a number of athletes, both professional and Olympic athletes through the, through the number of years that I have been doing this. Uh, and I find that a great opportunity because, you know, there's um, athletes at these levels, both professional and Olympic are looking for like small advantages to improve and enhance their performance. And I have found through the years that by transitioning over to a really nutrient rich whole food plant-based diet, their recovery is so much better than the other athletes that they actually, they gain a lot more than they might anticipate. So much so that some of the athletes don't want the other athletes to know that they're on a whole food plant-based diet because they've increased their performance. They really see the advantage and believe that it, um, it takes them much further ahead than their competitors. Yeah. Well, with the movie Game Changers, I think the secret is out. The secret is out. But what's interesting is even though that secret is out, a lot of athletes uh, are still skeptical and don't want to step into that place. 
you know, I, I worked with the bobsledders for a number of years uh, and tried to educate them about whole food plant-based diets and, the, and how, that it, how it would enhance not only their performance, but um, protect them from injuries. And I found that the women listened, which is always interesting, but the men just couldn't get it through their head that this is beneficial. And they believe that a Snickers bar is a good protein supplement, that they can eat McDonald's and get away with it. Um, and that protein is protein. And you know, they just, uh, those, those, um, those ideas and those myths that exist are really hard to break down sometimes. Yeah, so you weren't plant-based at the time of your Olympic uh, performance, correct? That's exactly right. I wish I had known, but back in 1994, I just didn't know, I didn't know any better. I was actually nutritional uh, science in undergraduate was one of my majors. And um, I thought I understood nutrition, but you know, at the, at the Olympic training centers, the food is really not very healthy. And they have like dove bars and ice cream available for all the athletes. And so the mindset there is I burn so many calories, therefore I can eat so many calories and it does not matter where my calories come from. So it's not uncommon for Olympic athletes, including myself, to you know, consume Dove bars and ice cream and snacks and dessert uh, or unhealthy foods because we're playing the calorie game. And you know, we're just playing calorie density and not understanding the implications of those foods and how it interacts you know, with that delicate biochemistry in our cells. So when did you discover the miracles of the plant-based diet? In medical school? Uh, no, I wish it was then as well. I did actually, but I didn't listen to my wife. So my, uh, we, my wife and I got married right at the end of my uh, first year of medical school. And you know, like now I've learned after 25 years of, of marriage that my wife is often ahead of me in a lot of things. And I just need to pay attention when she's uh, suggesting things. But this was my, right after, you know, shortly after the Olympics, this is 1995. And I uh, started medical school. My wife came to me after watching some programs on television and um, hearing, uh, Gary Knoll and some of the others that were advocating for plant-based nutrition back then. And she said, you know what? I really think we need to change our diet and go to a vegan diet. And so just having come out of the Olympics and you know, in that athletic world where protein is king, I said that, that same question that now comes back to haunt me so many times well, where am I going to get my protein from these plants? And, um, you know, so uh, we ate a lot of plants. She really tried to, you know, add in as many as possible, but we continue to eat a lot of meat as well. And it wasn't until about 2003 that uh, I was in practice and noticed that my patients were asking me the same question, you know, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me? I'm falling apart. And then there was the one day a woman was sitting on my exam table and she said, you know, Dr. Stoll, can't you help me on falling apart? And so I just asked her the question, what does falling apart mean to you? And I was expecting to hear the list of past medical histories or aches and pains, but she started in a very different place and said, my marriage is falling apart because my husband is tired of taking care of my, my physical needs. We're facing financial bankruptcy. I can't travel to see my, my grandchildren. I can't attend church or social activities and I don't have any friends. And at that moment, I realized the past medical history, the aches and pains were undermining and uh, eroding those most valuable components of life, relationships, spiritual life, sharing her gift, um, participating in, in important things and visions and dreams that she had for her life. And so that's when I walked out of the room and I asked myself the question, what are you gonna do to help someone put their life back together again? And through some circuitous, study, I finally found my way to whole food plant-based nutrition and started using my prescription pad to write breakfast, lunch, and dinner and saw amazing transformations. That's incredible. Matt says you look super healthy, glowing skin, and amazing teeth. Uh, <laughs> this as, is a you, as that's, uh, you know, that's kind of a telltale sign of a, someone that's whole food plant-based. It really is. It's like, it's the, it's the veg glow. Love and kindness has a fun question. She, I'm, I'm assuming it's a she, but as she said, he or she says, would you compete again if there was a category for your age? Um, you know, if I had time, I would absolutely do that. I, I still have dreams about running and sprinting. I still love to run fast. I will go out and do sprints just because it gives me so much joy. And uh, if there was that opportunity, I certainly would. 
Wow. So you founded or co-founded something that's pretty spectacular, the Plantrition Conference. And I was at it one year and it, it really is the biggest and the best. And I say that as somebody who's produced 19 conferences and been at most of them. Where did you get the idea? How did that start? And and tell the tell how about how it started, you know, with about I think it was 180 people and now it's basically thousands. Yeah, that that's um, you know, I I started working uh, with a friend named Tom Dunham and we were doing some health immersions for uh, Whole Foods. And this was about 2012. I just said to my friend Tom, I said, you know, it took me so long to learn this information. And it was very complicated and I read so many books and there was so much conflicting information. I just said to him, we really need to just develop a conference to bring together the experts to share the science, to have good conversations, and to provide an opportunity for people around the world to begin having conversations, to uh, spur ideas for new science, for collaboration, and to build a scientific community. And so my friend Tom Dunham is such a great um, uh, person because he really sees the opportunity, he's willing to step into challenging things. So he said, sure, let's do it. And as you know, you know, taking on a conference is not an easy task. And there's a lot of financial risk when you, you start a conference. So we started the conference in 2013 and we're very blessed that year to have a friend join us who became a partner, Susan Benegas, who's now the um, executive director for the uh, American College of Lifestyle Medicine. And we hosted this conference in Naples, Florida in 2013. And we had about 180 people from about 12 different countries and it was very successful. So like everything, we're involved in this idea of continuous improvement. So we're always tweaking and trying to improve the material, trying to improve the content and improve the experience. And one of our visions has always been to create an environment to enhance the formation of relationships and inspire collaboration. And that's part of the reason that we have just one lecture hall, we eat meals together, so that uh, around those tables and during the course of the conference, people develop relationships and friendships because I believe that that's where true change comes from. It's, the, it's those um, relationships and ideas that, uh, that are cultivated during that season. So the conference has grown and uh, we had last year about 1200 people from 26 different countries in Los Angeles. Oh, I'm sorry, it was uh, Oakland last year. Um, we started a secondary conference in New York associated with the plant-based world and had about 600. Uh, and then this last year, we were planning to have one in London. We are starting a conference in Bangkok, Thailand with a wonderful group there that will be an annual conference. We helped start a conference in Australia. And so that single idea of starting a conference uh, for you know, uh, medical professionals has really begun to grow and, um, and, and bring so much change. And the one year you were going to be in my neighborhood, COVID. But the good news is we're coming back to that hotel for the next couple of years. So we will be there. Oh, that's amazing. That, that, that. So I, do you find that you're getting more people, even more people registering now that it's virtual? Maybe talk a little bit about it and I'll, I'll put the, I'll, I keep putting the link on so people can check yeah, it out. Oh, thank you so much for that. Yes, you know, I, with all of these things, and I know you as well, with COVID, we've all had to make a pivot in a different direction. You know, after going to so much effort to secure hotels and pricing and food, um, we just had to change to a virtual conference this year. And so, so many of our speakers have been so gracious in making that change with us. We have an amazing lineup of speakers with a wide variety of topics. And that's one of the things that we try to do every year is to go out and find new topics and new speakers like dermatology and skincare this year with Ranjani, Dr. Ranjani. So, um, you know, we have an amazing group of speakers. We have about 22 continuing medical education credit hours for our virtual conference that will be held uh, September 11th through the 14th. And so the website where people can gain more information is www.pbnhc, plant-based nutrition healthcare conference.com. And uh, the registration is right there for the virtual conference. And even if you register and you're not able to watch all of the content during those few days, the content is still available for, I think, three or four months following. So you can watch it at your own pace and apply for the continuing medical education credits. So we're really excited that we've uh, found a nice way to deliver that content and still connect with people and help push out this emerging 
evidence for a whole food plant-based diet. Yeah, the only thing that will be missing is the food because I, like I said, I only attended that one year that it was in Anaheim, but you, you, they did a terrific job and it wasn't just vegan. It was whole food, plant-based, no sugar, no oil, no salt. It was extraordinary. I know that and the relationships, you know, sitting around together, talking, having conversations. We always say also that this conference is maybe one of the few places in the medical professional arena where you would attend a medical conference and be more likely to receive a hug than a handshake. And so um, it's because of the amazing community of people to, that gather together and it, it really leaves you feeling inspired and rejuvenated for the next year. Yeah, you know, the year that I came, you had more doctors attending just from Kaiser Permanente than you even had the first year, you know, that was so big, it was incredible. Yeah, that's been one of the amazing successes. You know, our first conference, we had maybe a half a dozen uh, clinicians from Kaiser Permanente. And there have been some great leaders there like Will Wong, Dr. Will Wong, who have really cultivated that group from Kaiser. And this last year, we had almost 300 clinicians from Kaiser. Unbelievable. You mentioned a, a hug and a handshake. So I think the last time that I shook anybody's hand was March 6th. And the last time I hugged anybody other than my husband was about then too. So you can't have one of these interactions without at least touching on what's going on in the world because there is so much confusion and misinformation but you are a medical doctor and a plant-based doctor so should we be worried of the you know do masks help us i know that hand washing is important what 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 do the plant-based doctors say yes you know um what's so interesting about this experience working through the pandemic is we are seeing the evolution of science in real time and one of the things that uh, has been so challenging is that because of the current situation, it's difficult to find and discover definitive answers in the midst of a pandemic. Um, there have been a number of studies that have come out uh, only to be rebutted by, by further science you know, in a month or two later. And so uh, one of the cautions that I always like to give when we start talking about COVID and recommendations and science is that we're learning as we go. You know, we are, uh, we are studying this process and I can guarantee that in two years, we will have much more definitive answers than we do today. And so with that, I think, you know, the wise route to take is not to be overly dogmatic about what we know today, uh, but to leave room in our narrative for new science, new discovery, and a refinement of the recommendations that we're giving. Uh, what we do know is that, you know, uh, the people that have lifestyle related diseases like hypertension, heart disease, type two diabetes, or older than age 73, and I think the age piece is largely dependent upon the fact that lots of people have, uh, that are older than 73, have a number of those lifestyle related diseases. We do know that that group that is suffering from lifestyle related diseases with an underlying kind of low level of inflammation are much more likely to suffer a more severe case of coronavirus, be hospitalized and or die. There's been an, a number of research studies that have come out of New York and Louisiana that have shown that uh, about 95%, 97% in Louisiana of those patients with severe cases of COVID-19 had one of those lifestyle diseases or were older than age 73 or obese. And so um, we do know that this whole pandemic has kind of pulled back the cover to reveal that this underlying uh, epidemic of lifestyle related diseases in our country and around the world puts people at much greater risk for severe cases of infections uh, and pandemics like coronavirus. But what's amazing as you know as well nobody's talking about that except the lifestyle medicine community. You know, we are focused so heavily on hand washing, masks and all these things that we're talking about, which are important and social distancing and testing. But perhaps the more important conversation is the, uh, the idea that we can prevent, we can suspend and we can reverse many of these lifestyle related diseases today with an intervention that can that can change the situation in just a month's time. 
Yeah. And what very few people are, are talking about outside the plant-based world is we wouldn't even have this if it wasn't for people eating animals. Yes, that's right. If we had a population of people, both here in the United States and around the world, that did not have type 2 diabetes, was not obese, we had 600 million people in, in uh, 2 billion people that are overweight or obese in the world, 600 million that are obese, we did not have those populations um, of lifestyle diseases, obesity-related um, inflammation and diseases, we would have a much different landscape today than we see with a, a coronavirus pandemic. Since you mentioned we'll know a lot more in two years than we know now, you can't know what you don't know right now. Do you think we should be erring on the side of caution and wearing masks? Because a lot of people are just, this has caused a big, great divide in the plant-based community. Yeah, there's a great divide uh, all over the uh, world with these recommendations on, on wearing masks, social, social distancing. So, I mean, we could always start with hand washing because one of the most important things we can do for coronavirus or any other infection is just learn good hand washing hygiene. And that's washing for 20 to 30 seconds under warm water with good soap and then drying your hands. Um, and second, it's really, what's really important, what's amazing, uh, the research shows that we often touch our faces more than 26 times in an hour. And so, you know, just to try and break that habit of rubbing our nose, rubbing our eyes, touching our lips, um, and just not touching our face is a wonderful way, not only to prevent coronavirus, but the transfer of other rhinoviruses and, and bacteria and flu viruses. Um, so that's something that we can take away from this as well. Good hand hygiene and good hand washing. We also know that you know, social distancing can be helpful. And for people that um, might believe they, are con um, they have contracted coronavirus, uh, to just not be around other people is important because we do know that if you're around somebody that has a lifestyle-related disease, uh, is obese or old, older than 73, you may be putting them at risk. And so I like to always encourage people that you know, in situations like this, we're not just thinking about ourselves. This is not about whether I want to wear a mask or I want to go somewhere or I want to be in, involved in, you know, this activity. We have to think beyond ourselves uh, about the other people that we'll be in contact with and think about their well-being. And we want to protect those people that um, are perhaps the most vulnerable in our society and do what we can to protect them. Right. Um, mask wearing, uh, we do know from some past research, including like the SARS research, the mask wearing um, may have been beneficial in preventing people wearing masks from acquiring the SARS uh, virus. And so there may be some benefit in uh, protection, preventing the acquisition of a virus by wearing it. Um, masks are beneficial in preventing the spread. You know, if you happen to sneeze, you sneeze into a mask, the droplets are not disseminated throughout the air onto other surfaces. So they can be helpful in preventing the spread of the virus um, in different uh, locations. Now, there's a lot of controversy about uh, the, the extent to which masks actually um, uh, slow the virus or the extent to which they are important. And there was a study that was, that was published in the proceeding of National Academy of Sciences in late June that really um, uh, strongly advocated for the benefits of mask wearing. Um, but shortly thereafter, the authors came under um, rapid fire from the scientific community because of the methodology of the study. And we're saying that the study uh, um, conclusions went far beyond the science that was actually in the study. And so, you know, even at the scientific level, these studies that are being done in the midst of the pandemic um, you know, the, the, it's difficult to get the proper methods in order to uh, demonstrate the real benefit of wearing masks. And so my conclusion is uh, that, you know, masks may be helpful for you based upon past evidence. And I recommend that if somebody does have heart disease, is obese, is fighting type 2 diabetes, may have some underlying inflammation, it, there may be some benefit to putting a mask on, especially when you're going to be in a large uh, 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 area where there might be a large uh, number of people in a social setting. Um, if you're going to be in a social setting um, where there, there's the possibility of spreading a virus to someone that is vulnerable, uh, just put a mask on. 
And, you know, it doesn't hurt us to do that. And we may be protecting someone else. And the science will sort itself out. And if we get to the, uh, the end of a couple of years and we discover that mask wearing was not really that beneficial and we don't need to do that, that's okay. We took some steps to try and protect other people and there's nothing wrong with that. If we happen to get down the road and we discover that mask wearing was really beneficial and it really did protect people and we did not wear a mask, um, you know, there's a risk of maybe uh, harming someone else. And so I always like to personally err on the side of uh, trying to protect other people and do what I can for other people to do what's right. That's because you are a kind person and not a selfish person. And I think these people that are so against it, it when, when you start knowing people, and the longer this goes on, the more that most of us now know people that either have it and have had a terrible, terrible time with it or have died from it. My feeling is, is, is since we don't know, I'd rather err on the side of caution than on the side of death of myself or someone else. So I don't think of it as a big deal. And like you said, if we touch our face 26 times a day, I, the only time I go out is once a week to go to Trader Joe's and get groceries. And the mask helps me. I can't touch my, I mean, I can, but I don't. And, you, and if that's for me, it's just a reminder not to touch my face. Yes, that's right. And like you said, this is a very real virus. You know, we know personally, as I'm sure you do, I know people that have been hospitalized, that have been intubated. I personally know people that have died. Uh, I know healthy plant-based people that have been very sick and that have been hospitalized. So uh, you know, this is more than just the flu. Um, this, is a, this is a serious virus. Um, I, the research and a, a friend of ours that's on our board of directors published research looking at pathology samples of the blood vessels and especially the lining of the blood vessels called endothelium. And uh, they found that the virus and the inflammatory response uh, aggressively attacks the lining of the blood vessels and causes significant injury to the blood vessel lining. And this may be part of the long-term consequences and delayed recovery that we are seeing for people that have suffered from coronavirus. But the good news is that his uh, organization, the Angiogenesis Foundation, has also done research to show that it's whole plant foods, herbs and spices and sprouts that help to heal the endothelium. And so for even for those people that have suffered a severe case of coronavirus, a whole food plant-based diet may accelerate their recovery and minimize any long-term consequences from the virus. Great. Wendy says that she eats as Dr. McDougall recommends, low, food, low fat plant-based, but she also has an autoimmune disease. Could this make her more susceptible to COVID-19? And if so, why? Yes, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting. I. I don't believe that we can um, uh, clearly say that the autoimmune disease is, is a, a direct increased susceptibility. It was thought to be early on. Uh, there's been some conflicting evidence about whether or not people with autoimmune diseases are um, much more susceptible. You know, theoretically, I think it's, it's possible, um, but we cannot say for sure. Um, however, we do know the healthier your immune system, which goes back to the healthier the gut and the microbiome, the more resistant to disease and the greater, of your, ability, the greater uh, your body's ability to protect and repair itself uh, in, the, in the light of those diseases. And so um, if you have an autoimmune disease, you know, I always encourage people, even with a whole food plant-based diet, to focus on, on foods um, and, uh, and opportunities to improve the health of the gut lining and the microbiome. Yeah, I've, I've, I have learned more about the microbiome in the last two months than in my 60 years of life because I'm hosting an upcoming GI Health Summit. And boy, that is, that's what everybody's talking about now. That is so fun, isn't it? I love absolutely, it. absolutely. So Shira, who's watching live, wanted to know what kind of medicine do you practice? What type of physician are you? So I was trained in a field that I didn't even know about in my fourth year of medical school called physical medicine and rehabilitation. So we have two arms of training. One arm is in the rehabilitation of brain injury, spinal cord injury, amputee, organ transplant, um, you know, significant life altering um, injuries or uh, diseases and helping those people put their lives back together again. And so I think part of that training really uh, developed kind of a mindset of uh, this idea of enhancing life, of adding life to people's years. 
Um, the second arm, which is the arm that I ended up specializing in, was musculoskeletal system. And so I was trained in interventional spine and regenerative medicine uh, using PRP and stem cells to regenerate damaged tissue, as well as sports medicine. And I served as a team physician at Lehigh University for 18 years and uh, still work with the bobsled team. That's great. My, of, of all the specialties I see, my physical medicine doctor is my favorite because he always makes me feel better without, you know, surgery and just they, 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 you have so many tools in your tool belt that help people. Yeah, it's a really fun specialty because the emphasis is on adding quality of life and regeneration and repair. Yeah, he's actually coming on the show next month to talk about some of the tools in the tool belt. Another design. I love it. And, you know, it's funny because I actually had a TBI, a very mild one this year. And one of the things he did, which I'm probably sure not a lot of people do, is he actually referred me out for acupuncture. And I don't know why, but it, it really did help. Help me heal. Yeah, that's right. I think the uh, physical medicine doctors are much more open to, um, you know, a multimodal, multi-specialty approach toward healing the body. Terrific. Matt has a fun question. Did your kids, because you have five, right? I have six. Yeah. You have six? Whoa. What, I, 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 girls. Okay. Well, your email is time seven. So yes, that was, we started that email before we had our last one, but we were so far down the road with the email, we didn't switch over to times eight. <laughs> okay. See, I didn't know about them. Okay. So you have six kids. Uh, Matt wants to know, did they get any pushback for being vegan? You know, um, there is always pressure, especially on children. And um, I think it's, it's really a challenge. One of the things that we tried to do with our children, we always wanted to create uh, an environment where they were inspired to make their own choices. We wanted to, we wanted to help them become self-governing in the future. And we never wanted to be the food police. So we would, you know, teach them, encourage them. We would watch, um, watch documentaries together they listen to my lectures they're whole food plant-based and then we would they would go out and we would not try to police them when they went out and made their own choices and you know like children they're not perfect they make different choices but in the process of making choices and sometimes bad choices they learned a lot of lessons and so you know we had times when our children would go to someone's house for a birthday party and we would go pick them up and the parents would tell us wow it's amazing we offered your children like hot dogs and cake, and they didn't want any of those things. They wanted apples and carrots. But we also had times when we took our children and um, our children came home and said, wow, I had like two pieces of cake and I have such a terrible headache now. And we said, yeah, that's right. And you understand why. So it was a good teaching moment. So we never expected perfection. You know, um, Confucius said this great statement that I, I really, um, I love, and I always made this a part of my teaching uh, fellows when I was teaching um, in, in practice that, you know, a diamond with a flaw is always better than a perfect pebble. And so, you know, we don't, I don't I want to impress that my children have to be perfect, but I want them to understand why it's better to make a different choice. And so they have learned to make better choices, but when they've internalized and personalized those choices, they have an answer for people when their friends ask, well, why aren't you eating that? And it gives them a lot more internal strength to stand up against that peer pressure. What ages are your children? So my oldest son is 22 and he's married now. Um, I have another son, 18, and then uh, Samuel will be 16 next month. My daughter Joy is 14, my son Elijah is 12, and my little daughter Faith is eight. That's incredible. So, wow, that, that must be a lot of fun at holidays. It, it's always fun. There's never a dull moment. I don't wrestle the big boys anymore like I used to, though. Any of them following in your footsteps in medicine? No, nobody in medicine yet. Um, I have, uh, my oldest son is very interested in organic agriculture, regenerative agriculture which I'm really excited about because that is, you know, one of the core foundations of food production and we need to change the way that we produce food. Uh, my second son is actually interested in videography and telling stories and he's very good at that. And he's actually helped me. He's my IT specialist and one of my videographers. So he's going to do a lot of great things in this arena. Um, and I don't know about the others. My daughter Joy is interested in nursing. So I, that would be great. Uh, I think sometimes they've seen the hard side of medicine up close and 
that they're not so certain. I never want them to go into medicine unless it's, they're passionate about it because it is a challenge. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we, we, we can thank your wife because it sounds like she really is what, what, who turned you on to this lifestyle. My wife is amazing. Yes, she has planted a, a number of great seeds in my life. And uh, she is the one that started and has supported us and made amazing recipes that have, um, you know, it, it's really, as you know, the food has to be delicious. And because she has made delicious food and delicious desserts, it makes the adoption for our families just effortless and easy. Well, I hope that she'll come on the show because I know she has a cookbook and I, we would love to see her cook, maybe even with some of the kids if they're around. Let's do it. I know she would love to do that. My son, Elijah, and my daughter, Faith, love to do that. And we have an Iron Chef competition a couple of uh, Tuesdays every month, and we just set them to work, and they make delicious recipes. So we'll do that. That would be so fun. So we have a few questions that have been asked live, but I'll go to the ones that were emailed in in advance. And so this is from Susan, and she says, I'm trying to understand the physiological mechanism that allows the brain to signal that it is not satiated even though the stomach is mechanically full. Does it have to do with the brain knowing that there might be a calorie or nutrient deficit? Yeah, and so the, uh, the study of, um, of feeling full is really very interesting. And, um, you know, so we have multiple ways that our body tells us that we have eaten enough food, that we've gotten enough calories, and that um, we are fully satiated. And so the first um, is the idea of the stomach stretch, which I think Susan was referring to, that as we eat, we have these mechanical receptors in the wall of the stomach that stretch as the stomach fills, and that feeds back to the hypothalamus in the brain to tell the brain that we have eaten enough food. And as all of your viewers know so well that, you know, a whole food plant-based diet because of the fiber and the volume and the, uh, the water content causes a much greater stretch for the number of calories eaten. And within about 20 minutes of that stretch tells the brain that uh, we have enough food. And so it is important to re recognize that there's a little bit of a lag between the stretch, the signaling and the sati satiation and that's why it's important to just slow down, enjoy your meal, have a good conversation, eat with gratitude, and allow that time uh, for the stomach to stretch and to, and to uh, give the brain the signal. Um, we have nutrients um, uh, receptors as well that are looking for some of those phytochemicals and nutrients. And based upon the nutrient content of the food, they also will signal back to the hypothalamus to tell the, the the brain that we have received enough nutrients. The, the microbiome, as you're going to learn so much in your GI conference, which is really great. Um, and all of your viewers should definitely register for that because that is the frontier of science and nutrition. But the, uh, you know, we know the microbiome and the, the, the quality of the microbiome and the types of bacteria have an intricate relationship with the uh, hypothalamus to signal sati satiation or cravings. And an unhealthy microbiome can actually stimulate the craving of food. And so as much as we would like to believe that we're in charge, it can be the case that the bacteria and the, uh, the yeast that are in our gut may actually be driving our hunger signals. And so normalizing that microbiome is really, really critical. And then we have other uh, drivers of, um, of hunger that you know, water and being uh, thirsty can drive hunger. And so I often recommend to people, if you're feeling hungry, drink a big glass of water. And oftentimes that may mitigate feeling hungry. Um, we know that stress can be a driver of hunger. So work on, on decreasing stress. Uh, feeling depressed can be a driver of hunger because we're eating to satiate pain. And so, you know, being cognizant of the fact that hunger goes beyond just eating food or calories, but it's this, uh, it's this life experience that's really important. That's so true. And, and I think when people switch what they eat, they, they worry less about how much, because as long as they're eating foods without nutrients, like animal products and processed food, they're always going to be driven to overeat on calories. That's right. That's exactly right. We have this, like even the storage of toxins in our fat, you know, our body can only get rid of toxins when we have an adequate supply of antioxidants. And so you can have a, a toxin driven hunger and your body's recognizing you need more antioxidants to deal with the toxin load and it will stimulate hunger. 
to eat more foods that are supposed to be antioxidant rich to, to titrate or to, to bind to those, um, those toxins to remove them from the body. And so if you're not eating foods rich in antioxidants, that, that switch is still flipped on and you can eat an entire meal with 2000 calories and that switch is still on saying we need to eat more because we didn't get enough antioxidants. Great. And Susan also asked, uh, grazing all day on small quantities of green starches and veggies versus eating three separate times a day where the caloric intake in the food would be exactly the same, is one better than the other? Yes. Um, you know, uh, a couple of uh, important recognitions is that, you know, uh, a bigger, I think, concept around this is the idea of intermittent fasting. That if we can, you know, contain our calories to an eight hour window where we eat for six, eight hours, and then we don't eat for 16 hours, there's a lot of health benefits in intermittent fasting. It turns on the uh, hormones like uh, insulin like growth factor to repair the body. Uh, it reduces inflammation, it optimizes the microbiome, it improves sleep, uh, improves the, the calorie burn and helps to manage weight much more effectively. So there are uh, so many benefits to moving towards an intermittent fasting routine. And um, so if you are going to eat your calories within eight hours, the research also shows that the more calories that you consume earlier in the day, the better and the, the easier it is to actually manage your weight. And the research has shown that people eating the same amount of calories, but those that consume the majority of their calories in the morning versus the afternoon, have a much um, easier time of managing and, and obtaining and maintaining a healthy body weight. So it would be preferential to have an intermittent fasting routine with the majority of your calories consumed in the morning at breakfast and maybe lunchtime, and then eating a smaller meal in the afternoon uh, and then fasting overnight. And so whether you are, uh, um, uh, you know, to answer a little more specifically the question that Susan had, what I would recommend rather than just snacking on things all day is to really eat a, a robust, healthy, nutrient dense, whole food nutrient dense um, breakfast and focus on getting lots of nutrients and a healthy lunch with a smaller dinner. Um, I think that would be better than just trying to snack your way through. Terrific. A question from a live viewer. What is your uh, advice for joint pain and inflammation in the body? I bet a diet has something to do with that. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, you know, there's a number of ways that I approach this uh, as a, you know, recommending food and then uh, trying to discern as a physiatrist, I mean, misalignment. So we'll talk about both briefly, but um, we know that a whole food plant-based diet is the most efficient way to reduce inflammation. And it does it in several ways. Um, you know, as we know, and I don't need to go into a lot of detail, but sugar, fat, salt, processed food, animal products because of uh, saturated fat, new 5GC, heme iron, um, all are inflammatory to the body. And the more that we eat those foods, the more they create inflammation within two to four hours of eating the food. And it's, it's easy to measure the uh, spike of inflammation and inflammatory mediators like TNF-alpha and IL-6. Within two hours of eating the food, the body experiences inflammation. And that goes into the brain. And so the more that you shift to a whole food plant-based diet, you mitigate or reduce those, um, in those causes of inflammation. But even in a, a whole food plant-based diet, there are foods that are better at reducing inflammation. Um, and they are, you know, the herbs and spices, which can to, you know, five to 10 times and even more um, antioxidants than some of the fruits or vegetables. Other very potent um, uh, reducers of inflammation would include things like sprouts, like broccoli sprouts have five times as many antioxidants and phytochemicals as does broccoli. So really focusing on adding lots of spices, fresh herbs and um, sprouts can, can help to reduce inflammation. We see with the microbiome that when people add in resistant starches from whole plant foods and things like beans and lentils, that it reduces inflammation in a couple of different ways. Not only did the foods and the phytochemicals reduce inflammation, but when the fiber is broken down by the bacteria in the gut, they produce short chain fatty acids like butyrate, propionate, 
that can go back and turn off the, one of the master switches of inflammation called NF-kappa beta. So it's even a secondary byproduct of breaking down the starches that goes back to turn off a master switch in inflammation. So the inflammatory system is turned off by antioxidants, by phytochemicals, by starches, and by reducing or eliminating, and I recommend eliminating um, animal products, you know, flours, sugars, processed foods. We also know that drinking water is important. So adding water to your diet is, health, is healthful. Uh, sleep is important. When we do not get enough sleep, our body goes into a stress mode, which increases inflammation. So sleeping seven to eight hours is very important. If we're living with a lot of stress, uh, that emotional stress or relational stress turns on cortisol, which is going to drive a low grade inflammation. So Uh oh, he froze. There we go. You froze, Dr. Stoll. Looks like I froze too. You froze for just a second. Oh boy, we had such. Let's see. The last thing you said a low level of inflammation. Oh boy. Darn. I'm not frozen, Gina's saying, um, but Dr. Stoll, we're not hearing you anymore. Ah, oh, so close. Okay, maybe he'll log back in. Isn't he terrific, guys? Maybe, maybe, are you back? All right. I think I'm back. Perfect, you froze for a minute. The last thing you said was a low level of inflammation. Okay. Uh, are we still good? Mm-hmm. It looks good to me. I'm not sure where I, I froze, but um, I'll just pick up with where I left off. Um, that, you know, if we are, so we're trying to reduce inflammation by uh, removing animal products, uh, processed food, flowers, et cetera, adding in uh, all those healthy foods, um, getting adequate sleep, seven to eight hours, uh, reducing stress because the stress is a really um, critical driver of chronic inflammation. And then finally, we're looking to reduce inflammation by bringing alignment into the body. Just like a car, if the tires are out of alignment, you get abnormal wear on one side of the tire. So our body is the same way, you know, as we're, we're sitting in chairs all day, crossing our legs through those periods of time, repetitive work types uh, settings, we can develop imbalances in our body and those on a joint. And so I always recommend to people that if you're having joint pain, to also look at the body alignment. Uh, one really great resource that I used for so many years in my practice is a book called Pain Free by a gentleman named Pete Agoscue, E-G-O-S-C-U-E. And his book has, uh, by body part, some real alignment exercises. I used it for 15 years in my practice and had amazing results. People just doing some stretches and exercises to bring things back into alignment. And that often helps to eliminate pain. Great, thank you. Elizabeth says, how much protein do we need in a day? Oh, that's a great question. Um, when they established the um, RDAs for protein, they also created a, um, uh, a little reserve that would uh, make sure that people were getting enough protein. So they they measured protein in and protein out through nitrogen studies. And then they added a little bit of extra to make sure that no one be, would be deficient. So currently the numbers are between 40 and 60 grams for most people. And um, that's also, you know, understanding that there's a, there's a, um, a little extra factor in there. So 40, 60 grams deficient. Athletes may need more uh, depending on the type of athlete, the size of their body and their, um, their level of activity. They may need up to 100 uh, grams, 120 grams even sometimes of protein per day. Now, what's really interesting, uh, as so many of your viewers know, because I know you, you're so um, effective at answering this question, Chef AJ, but you know, most people get all the protein they, protein they need in a, a whole food plant-based diet and you never have to think about it or worry about it and you'll get all of the amino acids that you need from whole plant foods 
almost every plant has all of the necessary amino acids, but some in very small amounts. So just eating a variety of plants or eating, like it's been shown that people eating just potatoes can get sufficient amount of protein. You will get adequate amounts of all of the amino acids necessary to build the proteins in your body. Um, as an example, uh, they did a study comparing 500 calories of plants to 500 calories of an animal-based diet. And they found that the 500 calories of plants tomatoes and cucumbers and lettuce, like a nice salad, had 34, uh, 33 grams of protein and the meat had 34 grams of protein. So more than sufficient, equal numbers of protein in a plant-based diet versus an animal-based diet. And the real question is, how do you want your protein packaged? Antioxidants, phytochemicals, fiber, minerals, vitamins, or in the animals, it's saturated fat, new 5GC, heme iron, endotoxins, inflammatory mediators, cholesterol. And I'll take the plant side any day. Yeah. I've I've let I've spoken in front of and have met so many doctors. There hasn't been one really that has seen a true case of protein deficiency, unless of course you know in child abuse and anorexia. But other than that, nobody's seen it in this country. No, that's why that question is. It's really the wrong question to ask because we do not have a protein deficiency problem in the United States or the vegan world. We just yeah. do not have it. If somebody's eating sufficient calories from plants so whole plant foods you'll never be deficient now if you're eating just junk vegan food maybe you could end up there uh, but a whole food plant-based diet you'll never end up in that place right they should be more worried about where they're getting their fiber <laughs> that's exactly right that is the question that's what i always ask people where do you get your protein and i say well where do you get your fiber because we know that most people today are getting 15 to 20 grams of fiber and they should be getting more than 50, ideally 70 to 100 grams of fiber every day. That's just amazing. Sharon says, do you recommend an algae-based omega-3 supplement? Yeah, so this is a really interesting question, and it's a little bit of a controversy in the plant-based world. Um, As is so many things these days. <laughs> and so, you know, uh, we what I say is that, you know, the evidence is suggestive, but it's not definitive. So um, what we do know is that there are about 25% of people that do not have the biochemical enzymes to take uh, plant-based sources of omega-3 fatty acids from things like uh, leafy greens and flax seeds and chia seeds and convert them into the omega-3 fatty acids, the EPA, DHA from ALA. So um, what, uh, you know, in those cases, uh, and it's, it's testable uh, through lab work, I will add an omega-3 supplement, uh, algae-based, to help mitigate some of the potential issues. Um, there is some suggestive research that for people who age, that those who are deficient in omega-3 fatty acids, they have, may have uh, some um, increased degeneration of neurons with aging. Uh, that's one of the debates. And so there's part of the plant-based world that says, if that's true, then we should take an omega-3 fatty acid supplement. And part of the plant-based world is saying, we don't know if it's true, so don't take one. And um, Sounds kind of like the mask issue, huh? <laughs> mask issue. You know, I, I look at somebody's history. I try to treat people more individually if they have a strong history of dementia, if they've had brain injuries. Uh, if there's a potential for those things, I will tell them just add a small amount of omega-3 DHA to be preventative. Uh, if I find that somebody uh, is one of those um, poor metabolizers, I'll add some omega-3, small amount of algae-based, plant-based um, omega-3s to their diet as well. And there are some conditions where we see benefit. Like I've worked with a number of children with ADHD and adding a small amount of omega-3 really does improve their mood and their ability to focus. And so I think there are some selective cases where there, there really is benefit. Terrific. And the last question, which we ask all our guests, in a given day, how does the Stoll family eat, move, and what do they watch? Uh, that's great. You know, uh, one of the things that we have learned is that simple is sustainable. And um, so we, we have learned that in the midst of busy lives, we try to just keep things simply reproducible so that, it's, um, that we can maintain it. Uh, so we start our day pretty much the same every day. We have a big green smoothie with as much kale as we can cram in our blender, and lots of, lots of berries. And then we'll usually have like a bowl of steel cut oats with some berries on top. Um, 
We, uh, I like to work out in the morning. I find that I, I get it, I, I get my workout in early. So I'll usually now, my, since my boys are interested in lifting weights, I'll lift weights with my boys in the morning in the basement. Um, and then I'll go to work, uh, my children to school. <clears throat> Lunchtime is, is kind of a, um, uh, we just do a lot of fresh vegetables, hummus, uh, maybe a veggie sandwich with some avocado, maybe some a leftover, you know, super stew or casserole and a big salad with some um, uh, fermented foods as a salad dressing. That's one of the things I really tried to do through the years is uh, find great ways to flavor salads that add additional benefit. So sprouts, uh, fermented foods. I like turmeric kimchi that I'll put on there on my on my salad. Uh, dinner time is very simple for us. Half our plate is a huge salad. 25% is some kind of a steamed vegetable. And then 25% is our cooked dish with as many different types of vegetables, mushrooms, onions, beans, greens as we can put in there. Uh, and then water, we just keep it very simple. Um, we move a lot as a family. We don't have television. You know, we'll watch a movie as a family a couple times a week, but we're not, we try to be outside, walking, working, um, moving. And then uh, we really try to focus on getting sleep. That's some, a place in my life where I cheated for a long time because I thought I could, and then it caught up to me. So I really try to get seven hours of sleep a night. I, I focus on that. Um, I get up early and I try to spend an hour just in quiet time, in prayer, and getting myself organized and getting things aligned the right way before I start my day. I'm so glad you said that, Dr. Stoll, because earlier we interviewed Dr. Ben Brown, who has been the life, uh, the uh, director, medical director of the Ornish program for 20 years. And he said that morning routine, doing something like you're mentioning, is the most important thing. It really centers your life, I have found. Yeah. Well, it's gosh, you, you find you, gratitude too. This is so great. We're hearing the same message twice in the same day. So we must need to hear it. You are terrific. Gosh, if we could just all have a doctor like you, we'd all be so happy. Well, thank you. I appreciate all of your kindness and thank you for what you are doing because you are bringing a, an important and powerful message to the world. And you have been so faithful and persevered through so many years to do that. So thank you, Chef. Well, no, and thank you for, when I get wonderful people like you coming on the show, I get to spread the message even further and wider. And thank all of you for watching. I hope you'll come back tomorrow at 11 a.m. when we have another terrific plant-based doctor named Dr. Neil Nedley, who is be going to be giving a PowerPoint presentation on nutrition and the brain. You sure do not want to miss that. Thanks again. So great uh, connecting and catching up with you again, Dr. Stoll. And I hope everybody will register at pbnhc.com for your virtual conference. Take care.